appreciate that. Let's sing a few songs. Let's see what happens. Do you remember when you were drowning in a sea of sand?
When I walked into that little church, you were there to greet me. You put your arms around me and you told me that you loved me. Yeah. 
that we were standing in his room. He started talking to Mama. That's when we knew he was here and voices from heaven and he'd be home soon. We're just strangers passing through this old world. No, we don't belong. We're just Person. 
than you ever have before. Have you searched in vain, trying to find heaven's door? The secret is written in his word. To being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Lay your head. 
All right. If you have your Bibles, James chapter 1. Let's put that on the screen. We have something in common. We've grown closer and closer because we love anybody, any football team that beats Alabama, we love it. <laughs> so we have that in common. If you love Alabama, I still love you. Amen? Uh, I'm just making peace before the message starts. <laughs> so I don't want you to walk out and leave and uh, get out of the will of God. Just because you love Alabama. <laughs> all right. James chapter 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. For your mercy, for your kindness, and your sweet love for us. And Father, we pray if there's one that doesn't know you, and that sweet love that you have for them, that they would know you today. And Father, we pray you'd fill us with your spirit. Lord, we're just the glove. We can't do anything except you fill us. We're just a, a glove. And uh, we ask you to work through us today and work in every heart. Father, give us loaves of bread from heaven, fresh bread from uh, the ovens of heaven this morning that we leave this place full, feasted on something the world cannot give us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Several years ago, I was in a conference, and I was singing, doing the singing for the conference, and uh, there was about 14 messages, and I was, messages that were preached, let me be clear, and I was probing each message for why. I was asking why. I had felt like I had a big question mark on my back. Why? I remember when my little boy was, uh, well, he's actually grown now, but when he was little, he looked at his mom and said, Mom, we were in a meeting, said, why does that lady's eyebrows look like question marks? <laughs> and I probably looked like a big question mark. <clears throat> and I was questioning every, every message. Why, 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 why? Why COVID? Why cancer? Why car wreck? Why so many loved ones lost and uh, gone and taken away and friends uh, leaving us and uh, all the questions kept coming. And uh, I was questioning why. And I had already written the intro to this message. I wrote it down and I was fixed to move on. And all of a sudden God sent this book about uh, George Mueller. I'm going to quote a lot of his quotes and tell you a little bit about his story, his life. But uh, he said, I never ask why. And when he said that, I thought, what? No, I thought, why? <laughs> I never, he said, I never ask why. I ask, what are you trying to teach me? So when I changed my question to what are you trying to teach me, he said, now his answer will be different for you. So you have to ask him. If any man lack wisdom, verse 5, James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So we have to ask it. So when I asked, he said, because I delivered you from three things that should have killed you to show you that I should, I can deliver you from anything. When the world says, no way, God says, wait. And uh, God, I, instead of whining and asking why, I was worshiping God for his mighty power. My faith was increased. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to say that. I always amen myself. The preacher said, this is not an amen in church. And I've always amen myself. I'm trying to get out of the bad habit. But anyway, uh, number one, we'll look at some, uh, some reasons and some things, some blessings that come from our suffering. Why do we experience suffering? Uh, the treasure of our suffering. George Mueller said, suffering feeds our faith. Though... It bring, makes us cringe with pain, the loss and the bereavement and the sickness and the poverty and all the, the trouble and heartache in our life. It feeds our faith. I love some of his illustrations. Uh, I'll give you a verse to go with that. James 1, 3. Though he this that the trying of your faith worketh patience. When you try gold in the fire, it shrinks. To purify gold, it shrinks. But when you purify faith in the fire, it grows. And faith is more precious than gold because you can attain whatever you need when you have faith. So uh, 
I'll tell you a little bit about George Mueller. He was a, uh, at the age of nine, he was already a drunkard. He was a terrible atheist, hated God, hated anything to do with God, didn't, said he didn't believe in God, but uh, finally got saved and, and uh, became such a great Christian. He said uh, God transformed him by grace, made him a trophy of, God, of his grace, and he, uh, he said, I wanted to show the world. He was pastoring. He said, I wanted to show the world that God still does miracles. He lived in the 1800s. And he wanted to start an orphanage. And he kept praying, Lord, is it your will? Is it your will? Is it your will? And God never answered him. So he changed his prayer. To, uh, and he wrote down the date when he changed his prayer. If it is your will to start an orphanage, I'll need help. I can't do this. I'm a pastor. I can't do this by myself. So immediately people began to give uh, monthly support and donate uh, items and begin to volunteer to be house parents for free for no charge and all of a sudden it was off the ground at one time he had uh, he reached 10,000 orphans off the street little kids that lived on the street in England at that day and uh, at one time if I have my, my uh, if I studied it right and, and understood it right he had 6,000 kids at one time this is what blows my mind. He had 117 schools. Can you imagine? I know uh, one Christian school knocks pastors off their rocker. <laughs> one, trying to manage one. He had 117 schools, 6,000 orphans at one time. And uh, he was praying. One time he had a need. He was always building buildings and, and buying land. And he said, Lord, we need $20,000. They call it pounds, but we'll simplify it, call it dollars. Lord, we need 20,000. And he said, a thousand came in. And he said, Lord, that's the greatest offering ever. And he praised God, but he said, Lord, it's not 20,000. So he kept praying. 3,000 came in. He said, Lord, that's the greatest offering we've ever had. Thank you so much, but it's not 20,000. And uh, a man came in and said, I'm going to, to India to be a missionary against my parents' will. And George said, wait a minute, let's pray that God will change your parents' heart because the Bible says, honor thy mother and thy father. So they prayed and God uh, changed the man's parents' heart and they gave him their blessing. And they came by a few weeks later, or he came by a few weeks later and said, I'm going to India. Here's my gold watch, give it to the orphans. And he said, pray for my sister that she'll go with me. A few months later, his sister came in and uh, she said, I heard you've been praying for me. Here's my vain toys. I'm going, to, I'm going to India to be a missionary with my brother. Here's my vain toys. I gave him a box. She said, give these to the orphans. And when she left, he held this box in his hand. He thought, toys. There's not enough toys in this little box. For, at that time, he had 2,500 kids. There's not enough toys in this box for 2,500 kids. And uh, one thing I'll mention about George Mueller is so unique, he never asked anybody for anything. He only asked God for his needs. He only told God his needs. He never put out a letter or asked God for anything or asked people for anything. He always asked God, and he never kept a dime for himself. Amen. And uh, so when he opened the, uh, finally opened the box, there was a, a ruby necklace with, he said some of the rubies were as big as eggs, uh, which are the most valuable jewel on earth, they say. And they say, uh, the Bible says a woman that is virtuous is uh, for her price is far above rubies. Amen. So thank you, virtuous ladies, for being so valuable. You are valuable to this world, right. to this world. Amen. amen. But uh, oh, I just amen myself. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, the underneath that was a diamond necklace, diamond rings, diamond earrings, diamond bracelets ruby bracelets, ruby earrings. Are you drooling yet, ladies? <laughs> and so he called the jeweler to appraise it. And the, the jeweler said, we've never seen anything like this. This is worth three quarters of a million dollars. And he took the diamond ring and he etched on the window pane of his office, God will provide. He etched in, in German, God will provide. He spoke eight languages. I speak eight languages, one word in each language. <laughs> Every time I go overseas, I say, I'm going to learn this language. And I come home and I remember one word. Yo quiero Taco Bell. And uh, obrigado. 
Hafta Buna and all them good things. But anyway, he spoke eight languages. But anyway, I said all that to say this. God will do a miracle for you Amen. if you'll get you a prayer list. Sometimes he said, "There's this is a three a day. He would tell his wife, this is a three a day need. We're going to pray for this three times a day. And when I heard that, I started, I, I made a list of things I really needed. We were going on a missions trip to Brazil. This man, everybody kept saying, uh, we saw where you're going to be uh, preaching in a conference in Brazil. I said, oh, really? Nobody told me about it. <laughs> I guess I better show up. And when I got there, Brother John, Brother John uh, Alves said, oh, Brother Cooch, leave the R out. So Brother Cooch, uh, I did it by faith. I put the flyer out by faith. Uh, thanks a lot, John. <laughs> but anyway, we had to start praying for money to go. And we prayed and some, uh, uh, before we knew it, everything, people started giving my wife money. And she said, I'm putting that on my Brazil trip. And I thought, she's going to. <laughs> and before you know it, everything came in. But we prayed three times a day for that. I started to make a new album and, uh, uh, or CD or whatever it is. And uh, they don't sell anymore. They just, you don't get anything off the internet stuff, the streaming, you get just a tiny bit. And I thought, what are we going to do? I've got all these songs and I think God wants me to do it. So we'll pray. I started praying and a check came in the mail for $3. Uh, uh, a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, royalty, royalty check from uh, having a hymn in a hymn book. $3. I thought, Lord, that's great, but it's not uh, eight thousand. <laughs> but before you know it, we're just about to the to see the light. We're just about to the end of getting it ready. It's uh, God provided all the needs. Why we prayed three times a day for the money to come in. What do you need? You need a miracle in your family. You need a miracle in your life. You need a miracle in your ministry, in your work. Pray, pray. Uh, we find the treasure. The treasure of our suffering, it increases our faith. It causes us to persevere and keep praying. Uh, then the, uh, the triumph over tragedy. It causes us, sometimes we learn how to triumph over tragedy. When we were, my wife and I were just married. We were just teenagers. And they say to get married while you're young because if you grow up and get you start get enough wisdom and understanding about finances and life, you won't get married. We didn't have any money. We were broke. We lived in a, a, a single wide trailer, 12 feet wide and 20, uh, uh, 48, 48 uh, feet long. But we thought it was a mansion. We were happy as could be. But uh, we, uh, we were reading a book. Somebody gave us a book. A girl was just a few years older than us. And it got our attention because she, was, she uh, was in an accident when she was a teenager. She became a quadriplegic. And uh, she thought at first, she said, uh, she, couldn't, she didn't trust God. Why did this happen? And she, she wrote an article the other day. She began to write books, by the way, and have a radio program. We kept up with her to encourage people that had disabilities. Had no idea God would call me to preach at that time. But it probably had some of her influence was, was there to help me to understand that God could use me. And uh, we were reading her books and, and uh, encouraged. And the other day she sent out a, an article. And my wife sent it to my phone. It said, celebrate suffering. And I said, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't just say that. Celebrate suffering. And... Uh, she went on to say, now I know beyond a shadow of a doubt when I had my accident 55 years ago, God meant it for good because as I traveled the globe to encourage people with disabilities, much to my amazement, many of those people trusted Christ and are saved today. And she quoted uh, Genesis 50, 20, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Those last few words are the greatest, some of the most powerful words of that verse, to save much people alive. And she said, now I know that God has used my wheelchair as a platform to reach lost people. Amen. Amen. And uh, she was uh, triumphant. She triumphed over her tragedy. 
Then the therapy for the uh, therapy for our suffering, the healing. The word therapy means healing. There was a man, I think I told about him last time I was here, Victor Franco, who was in the concentration camps of Germany. He was a Jewish doctor, and he was put in there, and uh, they didn't know really if they were going to exterminate him or, or what at that time. And they starved him to death, didn't give him any food except for one bowl of mainly water. They called it soup, but it was mainly water and one piece of bread uh, at night. But they would work them from daylight to dark in the snow and the ice with very little clothes and they were losing their muscle mass. They were dying. The men were dying all around. And uh, he said one day he was uh, digging in the ice and the sky was gray and the ground was gray. It was so gloomy and the people were gray and the huts were gray. Somebody turned on a light in a kitchen, in a house, on a hill in the distance, and that little light came down into the camp, and it changed the atmosphere of the camp. And uh, he said the word purpose came to his mind. He said, if I have a purpose, I can make it through this. And he watched people that gave up hope for their suffering. They, they gave up hope, and they would die just a day or two later. But he said, I'll be a doctor. He was already a Jewish doctor. He said, I'll be a doctor to the sick men in this, in this camp. And he had a purpose. And he said, I missed many nights sleep. And I was, my health was terrible. My legs were swollen. But he said, I made it through because I had a purpose. And he said, if I make it through this, I'll, I'll help the whole world, those that are suffering in the world. And he had an equation. He said, S minus M equals D. <coughs> And that means <clears throat> suffering minus meaning equals depression. Suffering minus purpose or meaning equals depression. But if a man has a purpose, if he finds his purpose, he said man finds his purpose when he serves his fellow man. He said he can make it through anything. And you see that in Joseph's life. Joseph's father had the victim syndrome. He said all these things are against me. His brothers were the villains. They sold him into slavery. But Joseph was the victor. He had victory in his spirit. And he wasn't bitter at his brothers for selling him, selling him into slavery. He had victory because he knew that God had a purpose for his life. He saved many nations from dying in the famine. Saved many nations. He served. He became a servant and found his purpose for living. And he overcame his suffering. Amen. The therapy, the healing is when we find our purpose in life. Then the tonic, the comfort we find in our suffering is the word of God. Psalm 119.50. Psalm 119.50 said, This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The word quickened means to bring to life again. The word of God is different than any book. <clears throat> The Word of God is its alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a seed that grows. Uh, it's the only book you can read that is a seed that's planted in your spirit. Amen? And it, uh, it brings life. It quickens us. It brings us back when we're just about famished. We can read the Word, and it brings refreshment to our spirit. Uh, read the Word. It comforts us. Then the test, the test of our suffering... It tests us to see are we abiding in Christ or not. Sometimes we get away. We're not abiding in Christ. Sometimes I'm thinking, boy, I can find joy in my music. Or I can find joy in the ministry. I can find joy in my friends. And sometimes you don't find joy, but there's joy when you abide in Christ. There's strength when you abide in Christ. When we abide in Him, there's fruit. He's the vine. We are the branches. There's fruit that we bear when we abide in Him. And sometimes suffering brings us back to Him. Uh, Rembrandt, I heard this, that he had two different pictures he painted, two paintings of the prodigal son. One was in his youth when he was at the top of his game. He, he painted the prodigal son and, and put his picture, his face was the man, the prodigal son, put his face, and his wife was the... Uh, Lady of the night, we'll call her. Put his wife's pay, uh, face on the wife, on the uh, lady. And it was a huge glass of beer, they said, bigger than life. And this was the prodigal son living it up. But after his wife died and his children died, he had no one to leave his inheritance to. 
he wrote, he painted another picture at the end of his life of the prodigal son coming home and the father wrapping his arms around the prodigal son. One hand was pulling the prodigal son's robe toward him and the other had his hand around his back, welcoming him home. Amen. Amen. And the suffering of life brought him back, brought him back to abiding in Christ. Then uh, the trophy, last of all, the trophy, we learned to lean on Jesus. John leaned upon Jesus. He sat in a seat where no other disciple sat, right next to Jesus, leaning on Jesus. He could hear his word, feel his breath, hear his heartbeat, leaning on Jesus. The others were arguing, who's the greatest? No, I'm the greatest. No, they were getting in a big fight over who's the greatest. And Judas was counting the money. But John was leaning on Jesus. Suffering brings us to that seat. It brings us close to him, leaning on Jesus. Lean on Jesus. Uh, I was searching for a verse. When we had so many loved ones uh, passing away, and I was searching for a verse uh, for God to comfort me with. And uh, found Psalm 118. He gave me Psalm 118.8. It happens to be the very center verse of the Bible. Psalm 118, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence put confidence in man. The next verse says it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. That's your politician. I just threw that one in for free. <laughs> but uh, it is better to trust in the Lord. And I was praying, Lord, what does that mean? I was reading the commentary and he said, uh, don't neglect your duty to, to your family and to your friends and to your church and to your country <clears throat> but trust God only him 100% to meet your needs trust him he'll always be there he'll always be there for you and trust him only to meet your needs to accept you and to bless you uh, learning to lean I was learning to lean on him for my needs George Mueller said a man came from the U.S. When George Mueller was seven, about 75 years old, a man came from the U.S. to visit him, and he said, I thought I would see an old man bent over with, uh, with uh, burdens, decrepit and bent over with burdens. And he said, you're youthful, and, and uh, you still have your, your vitality. And he said, my secret is not that I have supernatural strength or supernatural brilliance, but he said, I've learned to roll every burden upon the Lord. I do not carry one one hundredth of the burden. I lean on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Lean on Jesus for your needs, for your every burden, to cast your burdens upon Him. Cast your burden upon the Lord and He shall sustain you. Amen. I'll close with this. There was a man named Joseph Scriven and he was going to the... Uh, river, riding up to the river in Ireland on his horse to see his, to meet his sweetheart, his childhood sweetheart. They were going to be married the next day, but when he got to the river, they were pulling her body from the river. She had gotten thrown into the river uh, by her horse, and she uh, died the day before they were going to be married, and he said, the bottom fell out of my world, and he moved, finally moved to uh, Canada because everything in Ireland reminded him of his sweetheart. But he said, I, I turn to God for comfort and solace. Comfort and solace and guidance. He said, I turn to God for guidance. And uh, God comforted him so much, he said, I wanted to show the world the love of God. This sweet, wonderful love of God. And so he began to, as he was pastoring and preaching there in, in uh, Canada, he... Uh, he started giving his time to uh, cut the widow's firewood and uh, give his clothes and money to the poor and the orphans. And his food gave his food away just to show the world the love of God. And uh, had more tragedy that came in his life. But uh, his mother was having a hard time in Ireland, so he wrote a poem called Pray Without Ceasing, and he sent it to her to encourage her. And after she died, somebody found it and renamed it, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And we sing that little hymn today. There was a lady in the Great Depression that was, was uh, so, so 
distraught, so without hope. She had lost all hope and was going to commit suicide. And uh, she uh, turned on the gas jets in her bedroom and asked, got her little girl to come in and lay down with her in the bed. They were going to commit suicide. When she heard the radio play downstairs, a song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And it gave her such hope that she got up, turned the gas jets off, and went on with her life. That little song is still blessing us today. That a man that suffered such great tragedy turned it into, turned all of his lemons into lemonade. Amen. Amen. To, to be a blessing to the whole world. To the whole world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your mercy. We pray you would help us. Lord, if there's somebody struggling today, Father, we don't know their heart, but Lord, you do, and I pray you'd encourage them, Lord, to give those burdens to you and to go on, and Lord, we'll give you all the glory for what you do in Jesus' name. Thumb drive. 